following is a sermon preached at Grace Church of Orange, California. Join us now as we go verse by verse through God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. Orange, it's a pleasure to be in your midst today. My name is Andrew Cordes. I am a pastor from Melbourne, Australia, Hills Bible Church, and I have the privilege of being a part of the Doctor of Ministry program at the Master's Seminary, and uh, your pastor, Mike, is uh, one of my dear friends in my class, and I'm very thankful to the Lord for him and the friendship that has come. And now to be in your midst, I am filled with joy as well. Please turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the letter to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, and our reading this morning will be from verses 19 through to 25. So please be standing for the reading of God's holy word. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let us pray. Our great and mighty God, we praise you for what we have been able to sing this morning. You are most glorious and great. The provision of your Son has made it possible for us to know you and worship you. And I pray now as we have the Scriptures open that you would minister to us Take my weak efforts and may Christ be at the forefront of our minds. May he be magnified. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There are many people and places that are considered great in this world. In my driving around, I've noticed there are many fast food restaurants that are competing to show that they are indeed the greatest. Now, you don't have to be in this world very long to learn that if a place tells you that they have the world's greatest sandwich, it probably isn't. The fact that they have to tell you is a giveaway. But even though there are many places and people that are considered great in this world, we know that there is one who is greater than anyone or anything. This greatest one is none other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Turn with me to the opening verses of the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. I want you to see in these verses that Jesus Christ is supreme. He is better and greater than anyone or anything you could ever imagine. We read long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. Number one, Jesus is supreme because he is sovereign. Look at the text. Whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Jesus Christ is supreme because he is sovereign. His sovereignty extends over everything. Everything exists because He brought all things into existence. Secondly, I want you to note that Jesus Christ is supreme because of His splendor. Verse 3, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. 
When you see Jesus, you see God. There is no greater splendor than that. He is filled with glory. He displays the magnificence of our holy God. Next, we learn that he is supreme because of his supervision. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. This world exists and this world continues to function because Jesus is supervising everything. There is morning, there is evening, there is night, there is day. There are seasons because Jesus Christ is making this planet work. Next, I want you to see his supremacy seen in his sacrifice. After making purification for sins, we have sinned. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We are separate from him, but Christ has paid the sacrifice, which is himself, so that we can be purified. And finally, I want you to see the supremacy of Jesus Christ seen in his seat. We see at the end of verse 3, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. That place is the place of honor. It is the place where Jesus Christ is seated as Lord. And what is he doing at the right hand of the Father? There at the right hand of the Father, he is praying for you. He gets you. He knows your weaknesses. He sympathizes with you. He is praying for your holiness. He is praying for your unity. But he's not only at the right hand of God praying, he is also at the right hand of God the Father preparing, preparing a place for you so that one day you can come to glory. So in those opening verses of the book of Hebrews, we are introduced to the supreme Savior. There is no one, there is nothing greater or more glorious than Jesus Christ. But as we read those words at the beginning of Hebrews, I don't want that to be something we just simply read over and academically know and acknowledge that Jesus is supreme. The supremacy of Jesus Christ matters. The supremacy of Christ has consequences on how we should live. And that is what brings me to the text of Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 25 that we're going to consider this morning. Now, before we actually look at these verses closely, I want you to understand their place in the letter of Hebrews. The first section of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1, through to 10 and verse 18, is a foundation of doctrine. And then from Hebrews 10, verse 19, all the way to the end of the book, is the response to that doctrine. It is a practical section. And this is a pattern we see throughout the New Testament, isn't it? You consider Paul's great letter to the Romans. Romans 1 to 11 is doctrinal. And then Romans 12 to 16 is practical. The letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 1 to 3 is doctrine. And then Ephesians 4 to 6 is the practice. What we have here is what we could call the root and the fruit. But there can be no fruit on the tree if there is not first the root. And what has the consideration of doctrine been in the first section of Hebrews? Well, it's beautifully summarized in verses 19 to 21. We read, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God. Those verses are describing for us in summary the supreme work of Jesus Christ. Now, the writer to the Hebrews is writing to a group of believers who were Jewish Christians. These individuals have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
But as they've continued to go down the pathway of following Christ, the difficulties of life are beginning to invade, to break in to their lives. They are feeling pressure, hardship, persecution, and temptation is on their pathway. And as a result of this, they are being lured away from the supremacy of Christ and there are competing realities that are trying to convince them that if they only do this or that, they will have satisfaction. Well, the writer to the Hebrews wants them to know that they are cheap counterfeits. We don't look to these things for satisfaction. Instead, we look to the one who is supreme. We look to the one who is better. We look to the greatest one. We look to the one who is greater than angels, greater than Moses. We look to the one who is the greater priesthood. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the message of the first section of Hebrews And he tells us in verses 19 and 20 that because Jesus Christ is great, because he is supreme, he has made a new and living way for us to have access to God. Formerly it was closed, but now it is open. And it was through his death. He lived the life that you and I failed to live. And he died the death that you and I deserve to die. Jesus Christ is supreme. But he is also the great priest over the house of God. Verse 21, according to chapter 3 and verse 6, the household of God is the people of God. Christ is over us. He rules over us. He is our Lord. Now, after considering these foundational truths concerning the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the writer now tells us in verses 22 to 25 how we should respond. Remember I said, the supremacy of Jesus Christ has consequences in our life. What are those consequences? Well, there are three consequences that I want us to consider carefully this morning. And they're actually very easy to find in this text because you will see that they are introduced by the words, let us. Have a look at verse 22. Let us draw near. Verse 23, let us hold fast. And verse 25, 24 rather, let us consider how to stir up one another. The consequences of the supremacy of Jesus Christ in the life of God's people is the exhortation to draw near, to hold on, and finally to stir one another up. Now we're going to look at these three consequences right now. So let's begin with our very first one, and it's found in verse 22. Let us draw near. What we have in verse 22 is the greatest invitation you could ever receive. It is a call from heaven to come and worship God. Now, there are many invitations that are spread out through life. But there's a kind of invitation that I tend to miss out on. And that is an invitation to a great and mighty place. I don't get many of those. But here is the greatest invitation in the universe, and it has your name on it. You are being invited to approach God, to come and worship Him, to enjoy Him, and to adore Him. This is through prayer. But I want you to be overwhelmed by the two words, draw near. It's so easy to just simply read this and read on. What makes these words so amazing is that there was a time when you could not draw near. According to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were a sinner by nature and by choice, separate from God, alienated from him, in rebellion to your creator. 
You followed the course of this world, the power of the prince of the air, and we did what was according to the lusts of our own flesh. There was a great big sign between us and God, and it said no access. We could not access, one, because we could not do it in and of ourselves because of our sinful condition, but secondly, we refused to come. We are being satisfied by our sin and not by our Saviour. But the door has been opened. Christ Jesus came into this world. He lived that life that we failed to live. And he died the death that we deserve to die. And by means of faith alone, in Christ alone, we have been forgiven. A new heart has been granted to us. We have been sprinkled clean by the cleansing power of the Word of God through the Holy Spirit. We now have access and the invitation from heaven has your name on it. It is a call. Come and draw near. Come, let us worship the Lord. That's what we have here in this text. And I want you to see the description of those who get to come. It is those who have been transformed by the gospel. Notice in verse 22, it is those with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is the transformation of the gospel. That's what the gospel has done to us. We who were in our darkness, we who were separate from God, have been transformed, cleansed. We have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We are now acceptable in God's eyes and we are called to come, to draw near and to worship the Lord. But what do we do when we draw near? When we draw near to God, what are we to do? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4, and I want to read for you verses 14 to 16. Here we learn, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We are to draw near to the throne of grace. It is a throne. The word throne reveals power and rule. It is the place where God is seated. It is the mission control center of the universe. He is working and operating in everything in this world. He knows everything about you. He knows and he cares. We are to go to the place where there is authority. But notice it is called a throne of grace. We need the help of God to get through life. We need His grace in order to be obedient. We go to the throne of grace for it is there that we have access to God. But sadly, many don't draw near. Some people feel that they don't need to go to the throne of grace. But the only reason we would ever think that way is because we do not understand the supremacy of our Saviour. When we actually understand how great, how mighty, and how magnificent He is, we realize how small and weak we are, and it's only then when we see our weakness, we are then willing to come to the throne of grace. We should come because we need our Savior. But some will say, I understand that I need to go, but I'm not worthy to go. You don't know what I have done. You don't know what I'm struggling with. You don't know what type of person I am, but I do. You are just the person who needs the throne of grace because it is there we receive grace in our time of need. You go to the throne of grace and it is there you confess your sin. It is there you rest at the feet of your Savior. It is there he gives you strength. But my faith is failing. Go to the throne of grace, for though you are weak, your Savior is willing. 
Our text calls for us to draw near to God. And when we draw near, we come in faith. We trust him. We trust that he is the one who hears us. He is the one that will give us the grace and the help in our time of need. Consider Hebrews 11 and verse 6. For without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Because Jesus Christ is supreme, we are to respond to that supremacy by drawing near to the throne of grace. Go to the throne of grace. Adore God there. Confess your sin there. Thank him for all that he is giving you every single day and bring all your needs to the throne. You have a savior who is there. He sees you. He knows your struggles. He knows the difficulties that are on the pathway of life. He knows what it is to be in the midst of the muck. And he sympathizes with you. You have a great and glorious Savior there at the throne of God. And the call, the exhortation of Hebrews 10 and verse 22 is that we are to draw near. Draw near as a child of God and worship at the feet of our great Savior. But this now brings us to the second exhortation in this passage. Once we draw near to God, what are we to do? Note secondly in verse 23, let us hold fast. Because Jesus Christ is supreme, that has consequences. Firstly, we are to draw near to God and worship Him. But secondly, we are to hold on tightly. That's the idea of the words hold fast. It's to take a grip of something and to clinch to it, to not let go. What are we to hold on to? Well, first of all, let's note that there are many competing realities in our life that want us to hold on to them. People are holding on to things like popularity. If I only have a certain number of friends, if I have a certain number of likes, if I have a certain number of shares, if I have this type of popularity, I will be satisfied and people are holding on to it. There is another thing that people are holding on to. People are holding on to power. If I only have this much authority, this much leadership, I will be satisfied. Others are holding on to possessions. If I have this amount of money, this amount of wealth, I will be happy. I will have satisfaction. Some people are holding on to personal pleasure. If I please my own desires and cravings, I will be happy. But the problem is when we hold on to any of those things, they disintegrate. They will fall apart and we will be left helpless. Sure, you can have all the possessions you want, but guess what? You're going to die and you don't get to take them with you to eternity. You may fulfill all your pleasures now, but the time is coming, the day of eternity, where you will not be able to bring in those fulfillments. You may have power, but somebody will be more powerful than you. You may have popularity, but I guarantee somebody else will have more popularity and friends than you. We may try to find satisfaction in our appearance, but you will grow old. As we hold on to these things, tightly gripping the things of this world, they will disintegrate in our hands and we're left with nothing. The writer to the Hebrews says, you know that Jesus is supreme. You know that he is greater than anyone or anything in this world. And for this reason, you're to draw near. But once you draw near, he says, I want you to hold on. What do we hold on to? Hold fast the confession of our hope. What is the confession of our hope? The confession of our hope is seen back in chapter 6. Go over to chapter 6 and I'm going to read for you verses 19 to 20. 
We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner place behind the curtain. The imagery here is that you have a rope, and this rope is your hope. And on the end of the rope is an anchor. And he says that you are to take your rope of hope and you are to throw it through the curtain. Now, as he mentions this curtain, this is bringing back to our minds Old Testament imagery. It is the imagery of the tabernacle. You remember the tabernacle had an outer court, and then you come to the actual tabernacle itself, divided into two rooms, a holy place and the most holy place. And what divided those two rooms was this great big curtain, and there was only one person once a year who was allowed through those curtains, and that was the high priest. Well, we are told that there is a most holy place. It is the throne room of God. And we are to cast the rope of our hope in behind that curtain. And then we are told in Hebrews 10 and verse 23 to hold on tight. Now, if we're going to hold on tight and the waves of life are going to come crashing upon us, trials and temptations are going to fill our way the potholes are filled with muck as we go down this narrow path in life. We have many competing realities saying, come over here, come over there and be satisfied. As we hold on to this rope, will we be safe as the storms come upon us, as the waters begin to flood upon us, as we begin to feel overwhelmed? Can we hold on tight and will we be safe? Well, we know we will be because if you go back to chapter 6, we learn where that rope is anchored. He tells us to throw it through the curtain, but what's on the other side of the curtain? Who is this anchor anchored to? We read in verse 20, behind the curtain is where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. What that is saying is Jesus is there and he takes your anchor and he holds it and he is pulling you to glory. As you are suffering, as you are struggling, as you are being overwhelmed, you have a great and mighty saviour at the throne who is holding the anchor and he is pulling you to glory and the writer says that you are to hold tight to that rope. You will be safe. He will bring you to glory. He loves his own to the end, according to John 13 and verse 1. We are to hold on. And I want you to note that as we hold on, the writer tells us that we are to do this without wavering. Why does he tell us that? Because that is the great temptation, to waver, to hold on to other things to hold tightly the things of this world. But the writer implores his readers, you know that Christ is supreme. You know he is greater than anyone or anything in this world. You are to hold on to him. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Look to Christ. Hold firmly to him. And you can trust him because verse 23 says, for he who promised is faithful. He's not going to let go of the rope when you're in your most difficult of times. He's not going to tangle you up. He is faithful. He is true. He is right. He is trustworthy. And that's why we look to him and hold tightly to Christ. That is the only safe place in this wicked and corrupt world. Hold on to Jesus. We've seen so far in this passage that Jesus Christ is supreme. And because Jesus Christ is supreme, it has consequences. Firstly, we respond to the supremacy of Jesus Christ by drawing near to God. And there we cultivate our relationship with him in prayer. Once we draw near to him, we saw secondly that we hold on and don't let go. Cling to Christ. 
But now we have a third exhortation, and it's found in verses 24 to 25, and that is to stir up one another. What does it mean to stir up one another? It doesn't actually sound very nice, does it? Stir up each other. Well, literally, the word actually means to provoke and to agitate. In fact, if you were to go over to the book of Acts, you find in Acts chapter 15 that this word was used to describe a tension that arose between Paul and Barnabas. These two godly men had a disagreement concerning John Mark and his place in the ministry. And as a result, there was a tension between the two of them. There was some stirring up, a, a provoking going on. Over in Acts 17, this same word is used to refer to a work of the Spirit in the heart of Paul. When he went to Athens, he saw all the wicked idols over the city, and the Holy Spirit provoked his heart. This same word is used here, but not with negative connotations. We are not here being commanded to annoy each other in the church, even though sometimes we come hardwired to do that naturally. We here are told to do something that's actually really positive, what are we to stir each other up in? What are we to provoke each other in? Have a look at verse 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. God wants you to be in the life of other Christians as we gather together and be a means that stirs up, spurs them on to more love and good works, love for God and love for his people, good works, obedience, submission to the word of God. But notice at the beginning of this verse, he says, let us consider. The word consider means that it's something that we're to be strategic about. We've got to put thought into this. We don't simply rock up and, and come together with the idea of just simply um, having our needs met through the service and walk away. No, we're strategic. That means the person next to me, the person in front of me or behind me, is there a way I can be a blessing in their life? Can I spur that person on to more love and good works? Perhaps it will just simply come by you displaying the beauty and supremacy of Jesus Christ in your own life. Perhaps it comes through your own testimony. You can share with other people the victory you're having, even your struggles and your desire to be obedient you can be a means that God has ordained to be able to bring about encouragement that results in love and obedience. The text goes on to say in verse 25 that we are not to neglect to meet together as is the habit of some. This implies that there were some believers in this community who felt that they could skip church, that they were not really needing to give themselves to the gathering together of the people of God. But the writer here says that you are not to do that. You are not to allow the habit to form where you begin to say, you know what, it's not that important whether I'm there or not. They're not going to miss me. You need to be there because when God saved you, he placed you into a body, a body of believers that are from all around the world who love Christ, but you are to then gather in a local assembly like you are here at Grace Church of Orange and God wants you to encourage each other. That's what it says in verse 25. Encouraging one another. You are to be getting alongside each other, being a support and being a help. Are there any needs of anyone in this church that you know you can meet? Can you use your time and talents to encourage a fellow brother or sister in Christ? That's what God has called us to do. But notice the motivating factor. 
It's found at the end of verse 25, and we do this all the more as you see the day drawing near. What day is drawing near? He's not referring to Sunday here. I think the day that is drawing near is what we learn about back in Hebrews 9 and verses 27 and 28. We read, And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. What are we waiting for? We're waiting for Christ. Christ is going to return again. That is the day that is drawing near. Just as it was certain that Christ came the first time, he will come the second time. The day is coming in the future, according to Revelation 1 and verse 7, where we read, Behold, he comes with clouds, and every eye shall see him. The skies will split open and the blazing glory of Jesus Christ will be seen. He will gather unto himself his people and we will reign with Christ on this earth and we will enjoy the new heaven and new earth for all eternity. We will be gathered with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Revelation 5 describes it as a crowd of people from every tribe, language and nation worshipping and praising the Lamb of God, for He ransomed them. He redeemed them from their sin, and they have now been made worshippers, and they get to enjoy and delight and adore God for all eternity. They will be in the communion of the great cloud of witnesses forever. They will be in heaven, where there will be radically changed conditions. No more sorrow, no more sadness, no more suffering, no more sin. It is removed once and for all. God will dwell with his people forever. This is what we have to look forward to. And there are cheap imitations in this world now saying, hold on to this, pursue this and you'll be satisfied. Nonsense. The greatest joy that we have is ahead. It is Christ and it is to be with him in all eternity. And the writer to the Hebrews tells us this is where it's all heading. So why would you waste your time chasing after things of this world that are going to disintegrate? Instead, gather with the people of God. Encourage them. Build them up. Be blessed. Be a part of the body so that you can be a bearing light of the supremacy of Jesus Christ. This is the means that God has sovereignly appointed for us to be able to grow. It is the will of God that we as his people draw near. God calls for us to hold on. And he calls for us to stir each other up in love and in good works. This is the will of God for the people of God. We have learned this morning in this passage that Jesus Christ is supreme. There is no one or anything greater than Christ. We learned that his supremacy is seen in his sovereignty. He rules and reigns over all things. Nothing in this universe, every detail of your life, it, nothing escapes his attention. His supremacy is not only seen in his sovereignty, his supremacy was also seen in his splendor. He displays the glory of God. He is the exact imprint of God. The supremacy of Jesus Christ was seen in his sacrifice. He died that you may live. His supremacy was also seen in his supervision that he oversees everything in this universe and everything works because he rules. And finally, we learnt that the supremacy of Jesus Christ is seen in where he is seated. He is at the right hand of the Father. He has made a way possible for you to have access. He lived the perfect life that you failed to live and he is appealing for you. He is praying for you. He is preparing a place in heaven for you. Since then, 
Jesus is supreme and his supremacy is seen in all of those things, how should we respond? We should respond by drawing near to God, by holding firmly to Christ and by stirring each other up in love and good works. It is then we are displaying what awaits us in eternity. We have a great saviour. He is supreme and most glorious and may the supremacy of Jesus Christ beam out of the life of Grace Church of Orange. Let us pray. Our sovereign and mighty God, there is none like you. Great is our Lord and greatly to be praised. Give us the grace that we need to display the supremacy and brilliance of our sovereign Saviour. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for listening. For more information about Grace, please visit our website at graceorange.org.